Hi everyone, my name is Liam Jones, and this is my fifth and final video for the Remembering Benzie History Project. Uh, I'm 16 years old, and I'm a sophomore at Benzie Central, and this is my reflection video. This is my time to remember my favorite moments from the past four interviews, and uh, find a a common ground, find something similar in all of them, tie a thread between all of them. This year was very educational, um, in short. It taught me a lot about myself and my community and uh, people I thought I knew who uh, apparently I, I didn't before. Through this experience I've gained a ton of new role models and uh, my expectations have been subverted many, many times. Um, some of the stories and things that I've been told over the past school year have genuinely changed the way I think about certain ideas and certain things, the way I look at some things. Um, there are a lot of ways I could have taken this video, uh, but the one that seems most poignant to me and the one I really want to highlight, the one that's really important to me personally because I'm at this point in my life, I'm in the middle of high school, uh, is all of my interviewees' mindsets. They, they never let things get in their way, e even though they definitely had things they were anxious about. They had, you know, personal weaknesses and physical weaknesses and things they didn't like about each other, outside forces acting on them, but they, they never let it um, get in, in their way. Their mental fortitude was astounding. Uh, just how they all carried themselves through the maze of life with their, their mindfulness and their philosophy. Now, Mr. Gibbs was slightly different than the other interviews, uh, but I really liked talking to him because he just cherished his childhood so much. And he, his philosophy really was like, he wanted to maintain what he had in his childhood. He wanted to uh, give back the happiness that he had in his childhood. Uh, and he, he loved, I cannot express how much he loved the city of Thompsonville. Uh, he wrote a book about Thompsonville, that, that should tell you. Um, he had the most organized life ever. He, he really taught me what it takes to make it in life, to get what you want, to, to have an eye for the future and to, to, to always be open for new opportunities, though still remaining very present and uh, getting the job at hand finished. I either w worked or went to school, so uh, I was always, I always found something to work at, make something, build something, do something, and uh, that, that's how I got through life. I really uh, had a good childhood. Uh, there was a lot of nice boys my age in Thompsonville. The Nordbeck boys, the McGinnities, uh, the Rogers, they were all really nice people. We, we got along good together. Ruth Anderson was an awfully good teacher and uh, she was always Another uh, kid and I used to fight a lot, you know. She she had her hands full keeping us apart, uh, you know, but it, it, nothing unusual. Okay, uh, it says here that you were told by a teacher that you would only amount to a pile of oh, yeah. bad words. Yeah, a teacher, couple teachers told me that. <laughs> well, why was that? Why was that? Because I didn't like school. I did not get good marks in school because I didn't like school. Okay. You know, but when I went to barber college, I got all A's and B's. Okay. 
Mr. Yant was my first interview uh, of the whole year, the first interview I've ever done. Uh, and I talked with him about his time in the Marine Corps and the U.S. Navy. He, he was just a really pleasant person to talk to. He talked a lot about forgiveness and how we all ha affect one another, uh, no matter how minute of a gesture you make uh, for another person. He, he calls it a, rep a ripple effect, um, how we all take part in each other's lives. He saw things that nobody should have seen, but it, it, he always had faith in humanity and uh, in himself and in his men, and he just he just went with the flow. He he continues to flow to this day. He hasn't stopped. You know, and it's so interesting and so fulfilling, right, to hear other perspectives than your own because it helps you grow as a person to be able to see it from different eyes. So for me, I've always felt like you know that's that's what made me a better rounded person, you know, more than what I, that I thought I ever could be, right? Because I got to see and experience in things from other people and other cultures that most people don't get to experience in their lifetime. I love the Japanese people. I love them. They are the most honorable people I've ever met. You know, I know we have a history of World War II, you know, with the Japanese and Pearl Harbor and things like that, but that's history. You know, people grow and change. You know, societies grow and change. And, you know, I can tell you, you know, my time in J Japan was probably the most pronounced to me as far as a culture that I could relate to. People treat each other very respectfully there. They know how to treat their elders. They know how to treat each other with respect and dignity. And I think that's something that we lack here in the United States. This is a, you know, you, if you think about history and wartime history, you think, ah, you know, the Japanese, you know, they had the suicide bombers and they were mean, they see, you know, had this appearance of mean and evil people, you know, would do anything to win a war, which wouldn't seem honorable to us at all, you know, and then you go stay there and it's just like, wow, you know, why are they so nice? And we're not. I'll give you a story. When I was in Japan, I was, what I was, I left the base, I went for a walk. And, you know, I was walking by myself and I felt like, okay, you know, I want to explore Japan a little bit. And I was in a residential area in Japan, which is not hard to be in because it's very super populated. But uh, this Japanese woman, you know, come running out of her house you know, onto the street. And she's talk yelling at me in Japanese. I'm thinking, what did I do? What did I do wrong? I'm sorry. And she's grabbing at me and pulling on me. So then I thought, Something's wrong. She needs my help. And she dragged me to her, to her front door. And in Japan, you can't wear shoes in the house. Okay? You got to take them off at the door. And then they got house slippers. They got, they got slippers for each room in their house. So I had to take off my shoes and put on house slippers. Right? And she took me into the dining area where her family was sitting, waiting to eat. And I'm thinking, well, what's going on? I, could, I didn't speak Japanese. I didn't understand what she was saying. But what she was doing, she saw me. It was dinner time. Everybody's in ho at home eating, and I'm out there walking alone. And so that woman saw me and said, I need to feed that man. So she chased me down, dragged me into her home, a perfect stranger, to sit down and have a meal with her family. And I thought, that's, wow. Wow, that's amazing. What a culture. Another kind of philosophy that was very present uh, during these interviews was one that was very present in Mr. Deemer, my second interview. Uh, he, he had this, this mindset of just calmly thinking through a situation and using your brain to get out of predicaments. And um, he was an actual rocket scientist for the Air Force. Uh, so, yeah, I, I love talking with him because he was just very contemplative and appreciative of the people who helped him uh, get where he, he got in life. Siri. It's S-E-R-E. -E, stands for Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. Where 
Um, we started out with academics where they taught us about survival and evasion, resistance and escape, but it's kind of combat prep training. Um, but after the academics, they took us out in the mountains and put us in survival camp where we had 10 days of almost no food. We had to build our own shelters. Uh, they sent us out on a trek with people chasing us that had weapons that wouldn't really shoot us. They were loaded with blanks, but they were people playing the role of enemy trying to find us. And we're, we're using a compass and a map, a topographical map, navigating through the forest trying to get to our safe checkpoints where the friendlies are without getting caught by enemies. <laughs> that was quite an adventure and it was very difficult, the most difficult thing I'd ever done in my life, but very enjoyable at the same time. I love being out in the mountains. But after that, they captured us. <laughs> they put us in a simulated prisoner of war camp <laughs> and we had to be prisoners for a year and I escaped from the prisoner of war camp. So that was quite a, a memorable training experience. In the POW camp, they tried to make it as stressful as possible to give us a feel for what it's like to be a prisoner. Um, the academy no longer does this. The program was discontinued because it's so extreme. They would put us in stressful positions that would simulate torture, uh, that would they'd be painful and they'd make you shake and you'd feel like you can't take any more of this and then they interrogate you and then they do the stress position again. They'd lock us in little boxes so if somebody was claustrophobic it would cause them to freak out. I always took naps in the little boxes <laughs> because it was the only time they let us really be alone. <laughs> they give us a mission and they would interrogate us and grade us on our ability to evade answering the questions about our missions. Uh, and it, it was very unpleasant. So if we escape from prisoner war camp successfully, they give you four hours. You get to eat a meal of hot food and you get to nap, and then you have to go back in and finish the training. Uh, but most of the people who tried to escape got caught, and if you got caught escaping, they'd treat you pretty abusively. They make us dig ditches and fill sandbags and stuff just to simulate labor camp. So we were doing that, and we were actually, me and, and two of my co-prisoners were filling sandbags, and I noticed an area in the fence where the barbed wire was down. So I was stacking our sandbags in front of this. And I had in mind, there was a, every once in a while, the camp commandant would come out. And when the camp commandant came out, they would hit this gong and everybody in the camp had to stay, stand at attention and face the camp commandant while he addressed us, even the guards. And I had noticed this and I thought, if the camp commandant comes out while I'm st st stacking these sandbags, I'm gonna jump. Sure enough, <laughs> The camp commandant came out, and it's funny, the guards had been watching me. They took away our shoelaces, so we were wearing combat boots with no shoelaces, and it was to keep us from running because your boots would fly off. Well, I had tucked my, I had wrapped my pant leg around my boot and tucked it in in a way to kind of constrain my boots. One of the guards saw me doing that, and I, they thought, this prisoner's getting ready to run, so they were watching me. But when the camp commandant came out, they all faced him and I booked and they didn't notice. Nobody saw me jump over the fence. It wasn't until a couple minutes later, because they'd been watching me, they looked around, he's gone. <laughs> so I heard him, I was, I was evading through the trees. There were some trees near the camp. I ran to the trees and then once I got in the trees, I walked and I was going from tree to tree, bush to bush, trying not to be noticeable. And I heard him sound the alarm at the camp and I could hear guards yelling, we have an escapee. So I found a thick patch of grass. I just laid down in it and I could hear the guards walking all around me, searching for me. I could hear them talking. And then finally they gave up. I heard them walking back. And once they went back to camp, I went out and there was a checkpoint we had to go to. If we escaped, I went to the checkpoint and got my little ticket. <laughs> and then I had to come back to camp and show them my ticket that I escaped successfully. <laughs> It was fun. Well, my last interview was with Mr. Sheets. I met Mr. Sheets when I was three, and I've known him for a very long time. But I, I never really knew just how empathetic he was, just how strong his code of honor was. Uh, he was a teacher, and he was uh, in the army, and that's what we talked about, mostly his teaching career. And... Uh, 
I, I was just dumbfounded by how willing he was, he always was, to lay everything on the line for, for somebody he cared about in the slightest way, for somebody he was trying to teach, for somebody he had to bail out of jail, you know? Um, just just anybody, just how kind and, and open-hearted he was because, because he loves people and, and he's always trying to understand them. My best friend, best friend that I had when I was in the Army, was a fellow by the name of McKinnon, Mac McKinnon, he was from Chicago. He was a black man, and we just, we just hit it off, and we were really, really good friends. But it was when, with him that I experienced what racial injustice was and what discrimination really was. We both had qualified as expert riflemen and on all sorts of weapons. And for, as a result, we got a weekend pass. And so we went to, to St. Louis. And when we got there, Mac had said, now Jim, he said, um, you and I aren't going to be able to go to the same places. And I didn't, I didn't think of St. Louis as being a really racially desegregated town, a city, but it was. And he says, I just won't, I won't be able to go with you. So I said, well, can I go with you? And he says, yeah, you can go with me. So we went to what were called black and tan clubs. That was my first real brush with discrimination. And then when we were in, uh, we were in the deep south, and uh, then you really, really discovered it was whites only and colored, white colored. That was the thing. It, and that shaped me, too, I'll tell you. I, I, I couldn't understand, because I had been raised in a pretty much, my family was pretty much colorblind. My grandparents the same way, and so it, it had an effect on me. Yes, I would. I'd put my phone number on, and I'd say, okay, if you get in trouble, and it's bad enough that you don't want to call your folks. You can call me, and I'll come and bail you out. I said, I, the only thing is I put a limit of 50 miles on it. I only go up 50 miles to do that. But one, I, I broke that one time because I had to go to Ludington and bail somebody out. <laughs> but yeah, I did. Yeah. I chose not to make a big point of things in a classroom, but that person and I would have a, a talk, <laughs> and we would, we would get it ironed out myself. The other thing, and I think that this helped me to make my transition, and maybe it made me a little more accessible, was that in all the years that I was here, ex there was only one semester that I didn't have lunchroom duty. So that out of 56 semesters, 55 of them, I had lunchroom duty. And in the lunchroom duty, you know, you got to talk to everybody. You know, and these people that were being a little bit, yeah, acting a little goofy, doing some things that they shouldn't have been, you could go and talk to them there. And, you know, it wasn't, you weren't calling them down in front of everybody. You weren't making an example out of them. What is, what is one thing you think all teachers should have? I think it can be summed up in one word of empathy. Empathy. Yeah. This year has been tough in, in several different aspects. Uh, I've, I've had to go through some rough things. Everybody has. Um, but... To be completely honest, these interviews have been healthy for me. They have helped me a lot. They, and I just hope I can be brave enough to take some of the things these, these men have, have told me and make, make other people's lives better by, by seeing the good in people and by resolving my differences with other people and by believing in myself and forgiving myself, being there for others, and giving back to the people that that raised me and educated me. I, I'm definitely gonna try.